Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Microbiome Signatures in Gynecologic Cancers. It is presented by Marina Walther Antonio, PhD, an associate consultant in the Department of Surgery and Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and an assistant professor in the microbiome program at the Center for Individualized Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. I am Judy O'Rourke of Leverts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the ask a question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walther Antonio. I will now turn the presentation over to her. All right, well, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this event. Um, I'll, you know, it's the, for my first is a virtual event, so hopefully this, this goes well. Um, I'll be talking to you about the work we've been doing uh, on microbiome signatures uh, in gynecologic cancers, but my uh, path is a little unusual, and so I'd like to take you along with me so that you understand why I do what I do and the way I do it. So my first slide is really on uh, disclosure of intellectual property. Uh, we do have some patents filed on some of this work, and that does limit my ability to go into great detail on some of the aspects, and I apologize beforehand. Uh, but I'm happy to, to discuss um, some of those with you if, you, if you're interested at a later time point. So I'm European. Uh, I was born in, uh, in Portugal and um, uh, grew up there. And Portugal is in Europe, not in South America, as I often uh, hear. So that's the first educational point to some people. Um, it is a small country, uh, but it's, uh, it's beautiful. As you can see there, it was uh, really uh, kind of the Venice of, of, of Portugal. Uh, where we have you know, a nice beach and uh, I was having a great life. And then uh, now I'm here um, in, in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, and that might, might seem kind of weird um, why somebody would do such a change. And uh, hopefully what, what we've been doing here uh, justifies that, that drastic change in uh, uh, life quality somehow in the environment. Um, so I, I was at, at the beach, as I said, in, uh, in my university back home, and uh, I had a dream to, to really uh, work for um, NASA and be in the astrobiology uh, program, uh, which is a program that looks into life um, in other planets um, and Mars missions and, and those sorts of things. And I applied for an internship there as an undergraduate, and I got in somehow uh, and went to uh, the Eptai Center, um, Indiana, Princeton, Tennessee, Astrobiology Initiative, um, studying um, uh, micro microbial life in uh, Mars-like environments. And what became clear to me and others at the time during this, this type of research is that what we typically call extreme environments are really extreme to us humans, not so extreme to the microbes. <clears throat> what we found in those environments is that despite uh, the really um, uh, very different conditions than the ones we typically think as habitable, uh, there's a huge diversity of microbes and they were doing all very well. They were not struggling um, uh, to live or anything like that. And so it kind of changes your mind as to what is extreme or not. Sometimes our body is more extreme to these microbes than uh, these environments. And then I went on to continue in my graduate studies, um, continuing to study these topics in other um, uh, environments such as Pitch Lake, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a, a Titan um, analog, which is a Saturn moon, and then uh, microbiolites in Pavilion uh, Lake in Canada. And uh, these are um, analog environments for Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Uh, what became particularly interesting in the microbiolites uh, uh, project in particular is that these, micro these structures you see here um, are macroscopic. They're several meters high. 
but they are entirely built by microbes um, in the three domains of life, bacteria, eukarya, and uh, archaea. Um, and they are also have intense communication going on between them, which, you know, kind of brings to awareness that <clears throat> the microbes aren't just communicating, aren't just alone, uh, isolated. They communicate with each other and they communicate with ourselves as well. Um, you know, and this has been uh, an ongoing feature of life, whether we are aware of it or not, and that might become relevant to our health um, as we think about these things. Um, now, <clears throat> just to put things in context, and I, I, I like to show this slide just because everybody, you know, I, I love it. Um, I, I think uh, most people have seen this slide where um, it shows uh, kind of the life of um, history of life on Earth. Um, and how humans appear seconds to midnight, and if, if the clock was a 24-hour clock, um, and it's humbling in many ways. But really, um, when we look at this, this is really our story. This is not the story, really, of, of life on Earth. This is how we came to be. Um, so it leads to kind of a paradigm shift, um, because when you look at the universal tree of life, and looking in terms of genetic diversity, this is a lot more what, what you, you will see. Um, and you can see where you are there, um, Homo sapiens right next to corn and mushrooms, uh, barely distinguishable uh, from each other if you compare, say, Hypomedia from a Clostridium in the bacteria um, domain are much further different genetically than we are from corn or mushrooms, which is uh, uh, some, some of a shift change. Um, so this is just to keep, for us to become aware of really, you know, our metabolic capacity and how different we really are uh, compared to these microorganisms are extremely uh, diverse. And if you have in your body a chlamydia versus a clostridium, that's a very, very different type of organism. Um, then, uh, you know, to complicate things further now with, with what we currently know as well, um, uh, you know, or is it, uh, there's, there's some horizontal, you know, gene transfer occurring between microorganisms that really we need to be aware. And what you see here in this scheme is all that history, the bottom of, of that diagram shows you all events that are taking place in terms of horizontal gene transfer and how they reflect into modern days, which is the red. Um, so it's not like these bacteria are older than us. All the bacteria that are currently living with us are as modern as we are. They are here at the same time as we are, and they have a complex evolutionary history. And what they have been doing throughout that history matters to who they are today, the same way it does for us. So those are things to take into account when we're thinking about, um, you know, what these organisms actually are doing uh, and communicating with us. And so there's this new notion now of the whole abiance that I really like, um, that really brings that forth, that idea that um, we are not we are not just about our genes. Um, we are a complex um, a combination of our genes and the genes of the microbes that live with, it, with us. And the important part to think about this is that it's not just that we all are together in manifesting in our phenotype. It's more that because of this evolutionary history that we've had with our uh, partners, uh, microbes, uh, our body expects those microbes to be there to fulfill some of the functions. And if they are not, that's when disease can, can happen. And so it's kind of thinking that it's not just a fun fact um, that the microbiome is there, is that sometimes we're, we get involved to really rely on, on those functions. And if they are missing, we really have a problem. Um, so, and further to think about what is it that we know and what we don't know, um, when you think about the bacterial species that have been described to date, there's about 7,000 bacterial species that we are able to grow and, and identify. Um, in comparison, there's about 1.2 million insects, and mind you that their insects have their own microbiome that we also um, are studying. So. Uh, there's really a, a huge amount of, of information we just are missing. Um, and this is due to unknown requirements and interdependency and slow growth that we just are beginning to understand about the bacteria. Um, and therefore, we have to rely on some techniques that uh, do not rely on the fact that we could culture them or not, and those are uh, culture-free uh, technologies. They include genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, all those things you might have heard of. Um, and so the, the next generation sequencing type of technologies. Um, in microbiome, and because we'll see a few slides about that, we also rely a lot in talking about alpha diversity and beta diversity, and what does that mean? Um, so there's this diagram that you can see there with the fishes, for example. And you can see, you know, you can um, simplify this, these types of concepts by thinking 
of alpha diversity is a diversity within a site. So say site A has three different colors of fish um, and they can be present at different rates in other sites or they can be, uh, the fish colors can change um, and that would be, you know, kind of a beta diversity is when you compare sites A and B is how many fish are different. Um, and the, the more fish that are different, the more, the, the bigger the distance between the points in a graph, for example. And I'll get back to that notion, but just, um, it's kind of a good way to, to think about it, just um, to retain that in your, in your mind. So what's the microbiome role in cancer? What's out there? Um, there has been uh, quite a few out there lately. Um, microbiome can be involved in the causation uh, of cancer, potentially through infection, um, trauma, dietary factors, and all, all other things. Uh, it can cause barrier breach uh, that, that can lead to um, uh, microbes being where they should not be. Uh, and that can then lead to persistent barrier breach um, where it can uh, cause some dysfunctions at the level of the immune system and microbial homeostasis. Um, and there, there you see that all those effects. There's also some thought that can be involved in, progress, in progression, either with direct DNA damage uh, by toxins being produced or um, indirectly through uh, the production of oxygen reactive species. Um, it can also interfere with signaling and, um, and of course, inflammatory programs. In treatment, there's also been uh, quite a few of uh, 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 published papers now on um, the good effect of microbes and the bad, which can change between different cancers, between different drug types. Um, and here you see some examples of uh, some beneficial and um, some lots of beneficial effects of microbes. Uh, but either way, you probably have to take into account whether they're present or not and whether antibiotics are a good thing or not for your particular case. The active studies uh, we're doing are on uh, primarily on endometrial cancer uh, prevention and detection and ovarian cancer detection and treatment. And that has to do with the needs of uh, both of these diseases. Um, endometrial cancer is, uh, although a lot of people are um, not necessarily aware, is, uh, is the most common gynecologic cancer, is in fact the fourth most common cancer in women. Um, and it is um, as common as, as leukemia, as you see there, um, and it's actually more lethal than melanoma, even though that's not widely known. Um, NIH has also predicted that by 2030 will surpass uh, the incidence rate of colon cancer, so something to wrestle with um, if nothing changes between now and then. Uh, we set up a study with uh, Dr. Andrea Mariani, a, a gynecologic uh, oncolo oncology surgeon uh, here at Mayo, and what we did was to look at the microbiome of patients as they were undergoing a hysterectomy, so the removal of the uterus, uh, either for a benign disease, and you see some examples there, fibroids or polyps um, uh, or other um, things, and uh, or, or for uh, endometrial cancer diagnosis. And we set up a sterile field in pathology uh, where we can uh, collect sterile samples and kind of conduct these types of studies. Um, so we published our work a while back um, showing um, kind of a first signal for endometrial cancer that was interesting. Um, and now we have a new cohort that is under review uh, of 151 patients. Uh, you continue to see, see a beta diversity plot. Uh, remember about the fish and the colors. So you see cancer um, kind of in blue, and then you see the benign in green. A few hyperplasia cases, which are uh, pre-cancer states. Um, but you can appreciate how they are in different spaces. And so the cancer patients really um, clustered uh, differently than the benign. And this is based only on the microbiome data. Um, if you were to do a, a UC curve of that, you'd get a point um, 86, 87, uh, which is pretty decent. And, and there was a particular microbe that uh, really light up in the, in the data, which was the Spithromonas species um, that seems to be highly prevalent in cancer patients, not so much in benign patients. And you see a very significant p-value. You also see a q-value for a, a false discovery correction that is still very high. Um, if you compare these numbers to, say, HPV uh, numbers or H. pylori numbers with cervical cancer and gastric cancer, respectively, um, you see that our specificity is actually a little better, although it's sensitivity not so much. And that has to do just with us identifying what type of patient population we want to target. Um, as we know, HPV is highly prevalent in, in women. Um, the younger women only becomes a problem later in life. So these are things that we need to understand about the disease as well and understand what the population uh, uh, can, can better uh, benefit from this knowledge. Um, so we developed uh, also something under review right now 
a blind qPCR test for uh, for detection in the vaginal uh, environment. So this is something that women could uh, do a vaginal swab and know whether they have the microorganism or not. Uh, what we found is that uh, this is uh, the micro correlates very well with uh, BMI and obesity. So if you have, which is a risk factor for endometrial cancer. So if you have um, obesity or high BMI, you're at risk, um, increased risk for endometrial cancer and having the bacteria. Uh, we also found that uh, this marker has a 0.86 positive predictive value in high risk population meaning if you are a postmenopausal woman who is obese and has this microbe, you are, according to our data, um, you have 86% chance of having endometrial cancer and should probably be tested. Um, so these are things that we you know, um, are kind of discovering in now moving along. We also uh, kind of interrogating whether this could be more than an association. <clears throat> um, and we, we have kind of a hypothesis driven um, um, projects to, to go, um, find out. Um, here I'm just showing you kind of invasion assays we did with uh, Performona summary, which is a species, and uh, KLE cell lines, which is an endometrial cell line. Uh, we, we see the first uh, plot there is a, a fish uh, fluorescence and pseudo hybridization uh, type of assay um, where we did see some signs of invasion. Um, but what we didn't anticipate was that we would see cytoplasmic swelling, which indicates some necrotic impact, uh, which we uh, didn't really anticipate, but uh, in hindsight makes sense since the, the, it would mean that the host is not really in control of what, what is happening. Uh, and this is uh, what has been now um, associated with H. pylori as well. So uh, interesting there. And then the other S is just a cell trace um, showing that the bacteria are much happier. Uh, in green, uh, it shows the live cells, and in red are the uh, dead cells. And you can see that the green cells really, that the live cells in, in green really like to be uh, close to our cells. So they, they really like that. So, how do we go about studying these things, though? It is a complex environment with all the complexities that we just discussed. So, how do you study this? And the way I approach it is kind of thinking in terms of macroecology, how would you do this? So, if you were to study this, um, you know, if you want to study the savanna, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of species there. Um, you know, if you're thinking about what's bad, let's say the host uh, thinking about it as you're know, the grass, and you you have all benefits from having um, these herbivores kind of grazing your your grass and fertilizing your soil. Uh, but some of them, maybe the boars, they attract predators they really would like to keep away so that it doesn't disturb their equilibrium. Uh, so how do you go about kind of introducing change or determining what what's beneficial or not. And if you were thinking in terms of an analogy, what we do in terms of microbiology, what we are able to do right now, <clears throat> this is what we kind of do. So a colony approach would be to find a herbivore that kind of looks like that and it's easy to work with and put them in a very confined space and kind of grow. This is a colony type of approach, right? <clears throat> so you grow these microorganisms in plates and pure cultures and you try to understand disease like that. Um, it is what it is, and it's not a criticism um, necessarily, but it's it's a bringing awareness that that's probably not the best paradigm uh, to have, and that's limited just by what we can technologically do right now. But given my background um, with NASA and all that, um, uh, you know, I really, if things aren't working out in terms of technology and that it's not sufficient to answer your problems, then maybe you ought to change that. And so that's, that's what I've been doing in my lab. So this is kind of how I see it, um, how we, in our studying microbiology right now is that we, we have a plain uh, a vision that looks like this, so pixelated, hard to make sense of it. <clears throat> Maybe we are getting to a state where it's like this, but what I would really like to get is to uh, the state that macroecologists can do, which is observe um, their, their, their study uh, subjects. And I like this uh, picture for many reasons. Um, one of them is if we were to see something like this without knowing anything else, you'd probably think that this is the predator and that's the prey. Um, <clears throat> well, we know that that's not the case because we've seen this long enough to know that's the other way around. But the other thing that is interesting about this this image is that you see that the uh, um, buffalo is turning on the lion there, but it's only doing that because it's not outnumbered, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be doing that. And we have to think about bacteria in that way as well because there's a lot of bacterial communication and what's called quorum sensing and quorum quenching where they can uh, change behavior depending on uh, the context and what they perceive to be threats, threatening uh, environment or not. So we really need to, to think about those things as well. And this is just to illustrate that, you know, we only need to look hard enough to really find the real relationship. 
then uh, we have, uh, you know, this is kind of what I really would like to to see. Um, it's kind of these ant farms. I really like the idea that you could see through kind of a system and uh, and, and really understand what, what's happening in the inside. And this, this would be a great, great system. So what looks like that? Uh, this is what I call kind of a microbiome dollhouse, and uh, which is microfluidics technology. Um, this, this particular platform, which is one of the ones we're using, it's called an optofluidics platform. And the concept was developed by Paul Blaney at Stanford, who is now at Broad Institute. Um, and this involves basically an advanced microscope with laser tweezers that can, uh, that can facilitate uh, the movement of the bacteria. You can use a, a, a MATLAB basically interface where you can move uh, the cells um, uh, with a mouse click. Um, and then it has a microfluidic system, and that's to uh, really uh, work in small dimensions, uh, which are appropriate for the microbes. Uh, we also work in collaboration for scale from the University of Utah, which <clears throat> uh, can mass produce <clears throat> if we do a design and a prototype testing, and then we want to produce, say, 100 of these things, um, you know, that he can, uh, he, can, he can make it happen, and that's been incredibly useful. Um, also, Kevin Bennett here at the <clears throat> Department of Engineering at Mayo can, uh, has, a, has a group of 60 to 70 engineers that really help us uh, kind of put the parts together um, and, and adjust uh, uh, interfaces as we need. In this case, you see here is an interface to uh, create a microaerophilic environment. I'm very animate about studying our own cells in, in their true environment, and that is not not be at, um, at atmospheric levels of oxygen uh, like, like most people do. Uh, which is a 21% level of oxygen that's not uh, reflective of what the cells experience in our body at 5% oxygen is much more realistic even below um, tumor environments go down to 2-1% at times. And we should be studying them like that because oxygen has a huge impact on how they respond to their environment and interactions. Um, and so we are um, take caution with that. Um, Yuan Liu is a very uh, talented engineer in my team and I think you won't be able to see these videos, but it was just uh, basically showing uh, food coloring through channels and how we can uh, kind of control those flows. Um, and this also had a few a few videos. I'm happy to share all these videos with you uh, if, if you'd wish. Um, uh, but they uh, just show how you can move the cells with a simple click of a mouse um, and kind of see how they react to that movement. Um, they're kind of neat videos. And uh, again, happy to share. And just drop me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to send them to you. Um, so we, we have published recently on uh, uh, the development of effective bacterial cell lysis um, for whole genome, single cell whole genome amplification in platforms. We chose these three microorganisms because they're notoriously difficult to work with. And we wanted to show that our protocols um, could work with gram positives, gram negative, eukaryotic microorganisms as well. Um, and here you can see how we managed to do that and we can um, uh, sequence that data uh, without much problem, so we can do all these studies at a very fine, detailed level. So in summary for the endometrial cancer part, um, uh, I'd like you to retain that the microbiome biomarker uh, could be of clinical value uh, with a 0.86 uh, positive predictive value, you know, these in postmenopausal women. This could have um, some clinical application. Um, also that uh, the organism we found associated with the disease um, uh, might have uh, some in it. Um, there's, we have evidence of innovation and in, in necrotic impact um, and, and others as we study uh, the different hypotheses. And um, we, are, we are studying uh, uh, those. I can't go into the details of them uh, right now, but uh, you know, happy to discuss that at a later time point as well. On the ovarian cancer uh, project, uh, much different type of disease, um, doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. People um, seem to be more aware of it because it is so deadly. Um, as you see there, 60% um, uh, of the cases are uh, found when they are metastatic, and, and that leads to uh, less than 30% five-year rate survival, and, and that's uh, uh, really problematic. So we did kind of a study to try to see if we could find anything similar to what we found in, uh, in endometrial cancer. And unfortunately, you know, we weren't able to find um, that light at the end of the tunnel uh, for ovarian cancer. Uh, you see here the plots. Um, you see the first one is alpha diversity, so thinking uh, how many different colored fish there are between the benign and ovarian cancer. And what you see is that there's no significant value, so this is not going to be a story of 
you can do a vaginal swab and know if you have a microorganism that puts you at risk for ovarian cancer. Uh, we really don't, don't see that in ovarian, unfortunately. Uh, and you see that in beta as well. We can't distinguish the populations with the ovarian, um, with, a, with a vaginal or cervical swab. But in the endometrium, um, it changes a little, the story changes a little bit. Um, so we can see and appreciate that the ovarian um, cancer here on your left on the alpha diversity uh, does have less of a, um, uh, uh, my, less, less microbes um, than, uh, or less diversity of microbes than the benign group, um, even though we can't quite distinguish them in the, in the beta diversity plots. Um, but they do seem to have uh, a loss of diversity. And we don't know why that would be the case, um, other than think that there could be some immune involvement into um, you know, uh, intolerance for some microbes that might be beneficial. Um, uh, we do see the same trend in the ovarian tissue when we look at the ovaries of cancer patients versus ovaries of patients that uh, do not have ovarian cancer. Uh, we see that. Uh, also that trend of loss, and we can actually distinguish the groups in the beta diversity. So we can distinguish the microbiome of an ovarian cancer from an ovary of somebody with a benign disease. This is not really, uh, you know, terribly useful in, in terms of a biomarker, because you don't want to be accessing the, the ovarian tissue necessarily, but it can lead to some uh, great findings uh, for mechanistic purposes and trying to understand uh, what's happening in the disease. Kind of an incidental finding was that um, the microbiome might be uh, predictive of treatment outcomes. So as part of our collection in the OR, we collected vaginal um, swabs and uh, cervical and swabs and scrapes and uh, urine through the catheter. And we also did a pelvic wash or collected ascites if the patients had it. And what you see there is that, um, you know, we as part of kind of the reviewing uh, how the patients are doing later on, we kept following them up. <clears throat> These are patients who followed for the next two years after collection and see whether they are responding to treatment or not. And what you see there, and again, this is based solely on the microbiome data, you can see that patients who are um, on remission look different than the ones that are in progression two years later, um, based just on the ascites microbiome uh, at the time of surgery before they had any treatment. And so there could be, you know, in the similar story to what <clears throat> we are now seeing with the pancreatic cancer, um, that there are some uh, microbes that can um, impact the uh, resistance to drugs. We could be thinking, we could be seeing something um, similar in ovarian cancer. Um, we do not see this in other sample types. Um, we did look for this in, um, uh, you know, uh, vaginal samples or the uterine samples or even ovarian. The ascites was the one that correlated with the response. Um, and there could be some meaning to that. Um, we are investigating that. Uh, we also have <clears throat> the ovarian cancer treatment um, a project where what we are doing here is looking into the role of metformin um, in, in the cancer recurrence. Uh, what you see there in the plots in the middle is that if you look closely, you'll see that there's uh, the red line are diabetic patients taking metformin. And then you see the blue and the uh, non-diabetic patients and the yellow diabetic patients not taking metformin. And what's striking about this, both on the top plot, which is a probability of recurrence, and the bottom plot of probability of survival, is that you see that diabetic patients taking metformin do better than even non-diabetic patients. Uh, this is very surprising, as you would expect that a comorbidity of this type would uh, be harm, you know, uh, leads to, to uh, poor outcomes. Um, and leads you to think that there is some, some kind of role that metformin might have um, on, on, the, on the cancer recurrence. And this has been uh, verified in uh, mouse animal models as well. So what we are now doing is that we have a clinical <clears throat> trial with the University of Chicago, where a uh, clinical phase two a medical trial, where we are uh, enrolling patients, and at the time of surgery, we either put them on a placebo or a uh, metformin, and then we collect samples <clears throat> throughout their um, their treatment. So at the enrollment and uh, throughout chemotherapy treatment, and then uh, following a two-year follow-up after therapy to see how um, they're doing. Um, and we don't have results yet, and we're about mm, half a year from finishing uh, this this time frame. Um, what we are uh, looking and what we are trying to see is whether there is a microbiome correlation with um, with the response that the patients have and if it 
it can add to whether a patient responds or not. Uh, we do have another arm to this study, which is a, a patient-derived xenograft model. Um, and here we're kind of mimicking uh, what's, what we're doing with the patients. So we have mice that <clears throat> just are in control. Um, they're just, they have the cancer and they're not treated for it. And then others that are just given metformin, others that are given a, a chemotherapy treatment, carboplatin uh, plus paclitaxel chemotherapy. And then a fourth group that is given both uh, the chemotherapy treatment and the metformin and see what happens uh, to them. And the results we have indicate preliminary results. We don't have the results for all the models. We will be adding those soon. But the preliminary ones we have, as you see there on the left, is that this is a chemosensitive model, so uh, a, a model that responds to, to treatment. <clears throat> and we don't really see a difference between the combo, which is metformin and the chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy alone. They both respond to treatment um, equally. The p-value significance is between the metformin control versus combo uh, chemotherapy. Uh, but when we look in the microbiome, what we do see is that there is some effect of the metformin here. So you see on the first um, the first plot there, uh, first bar is a control, um, and that's the number of species observed. And then you see the chemotherapy really drags that down and kind of impacts that microbial microbial diversity, and this is in the gut. So we know that a loss of diversity tends to equal um, um, kind of health problems. Um, but when you add metformin to that chemotherapy treatment, you kind of rescue that phenotype. You don't see that even though the mouse does as well in terms of um, you know response to treatment, they look much healthier. And actually, we have uh, you know data indicating that they are. Uh, you know, their fur looks better, they just look in better health overall, and that can correlate to the microbiome. Um, and so we are thinking that in the chemosensitive models, maybe there, there isn't uh, much of a, you know, difference in terms of the impact on the cancer itself, but on the overall health, which could be very significant to the patients still um, and, and make a difference in their life. For the chemo-resistant models, um, there does seem to be uh, an impact. Um, as you see here, uh, the, the combo is the, the blue line at the bottom. And even though it doesn't completely make the change, the, the phenotype of, of, of the mice to be you know, to, to become sensitive to the therapy, uh, it does lead to a drastic reduction of the growth of the tumor. So it kind of seems to sensitize potentially um, the, the, the tumor to respond to treatment. <clears throat> Microbiome, we, we don't have a whole lot of data points as you see here, and we're adding some more uh, mice to this Hard to tell here if there's going to be an effect or not. Uh, the, the chemo-resistant models just do very poorly um, <clears throat> throughout this, uh, this treatment, uh, but we didn't see a, a response there in the, in the microbiome so far. Um, <clears throat> but in the beta diversity, even though, you know, if you go just back one, um, even though the, the, say the number of microbes were different in the chemo-resistant, the, the type of microbes that are present are different. Um, and you see chemosensitive, not really, but on the chemoresistant, they are. So uh, it seems like the, the treatment can lead to a change of, of uh, actual community, of what's present, and that can make a difference in their outcome. So we are investigating that. So ovarian cancer uh, summary, um, where I'd like you to retain is that microbiome um, use may be possible in the uterus. It's probably not in the vaginal tract, unfortunately, but the uterus would still be uh, very helpful for the patients. <clears throat> there really, um, there is no screening for ovarian cancer, as, as we all know, um, and this would still be something very viable to assess the uterine environment as a proxy. Um, also, ascites microbiome composition may be predictive of treatment outcome. We'll have to uh, continue to look into this, but it would be an interesting um, uh, finding um, and, and could be also uh, have some impact on, on patient treatment. Uh, metformin microbiome action seems differential between chemo-resistant and chemosensitive uh, models. <clears throat> Again, we are adding data to this to this uh, work, um, but there might be something that is uh, fundamentally different, um, and, and that includes microbiome as well. And we are studying and have some uh, grant funding for some uh, hypothesis-driven mechanisms of metformin in, uh, microbiome impact on host, um, and that involves some uh, drug testing. And uh, just to finalize and um, I thank everyone involved, you saw the faces of a lot of those involved along uh, the way. Um, it is a, a team effort um, as usual. 
and um, you know the needs of the patient come first. I really like this um, this cartoon you see there on the left. It says uh, medicine needs research, and uh, research needs people like you to make sure they've got it right. Um, I really have to uh, thank the patients uh, first and foremost for allowing us to do this, even though they know that their health is not really uh, going to benefit from that most likely, um, and they still do it uh, because they want to uh, help others, and that's uh, very inspiring. Uh, given the difficult situation they're in and their uh, diagnosis. Um, also thinking, of course, um, the, the funding, uh, none of this could be possible without the money, uh, obviously. Um, and uh, there's different funding for endometrial and, and ovarian cancer, you can uh, see there. Um, Heidi Nelson, really would like to thank her uh, in particular. Uh, she's the microbiome director, also the chair of surgery. And she has really had the vision to put together a very interdisciplinary team um, that is not uh, you know, the most common one, especially in, in, in Mayo, there's so um, specialized times. Um, so it's really uh, refreshing to, to have her as a leader in our program. Um, and also Scott Kaufman and Bill Clive have been mentors um, for uh, both projects. And um, thank you for listening, and I hope you uh, heard something interesting that will uh, spike your interest in the uh, Thank you, Dr. Walter Antonio, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions. Let's get started. First question is, what is the applicability of microfluidic technologies to cancer research? So I think uh, microfluidics technologies um, are really changing the way we uh, do things. Uh, you know, I kind of covered that through the presentation in terms of paradigm shifts and us thinking about how microbes um, function at their own scale at their own time rather than what's convenient for us or possible for us to do. Uh, we are exploring uh, different microfluidics platforms. The one that I covered today was an optofluidics, which is a very um, you know, specialized tool um, that, that needs a lot of expertise to be run. Uh, but once kind of the complexity of the problem is found, uh, then and we are already doing that, then we can move into other platforms such as droplet platforms and uh, digital microfluidics which are a lot more um, high throughput, um, automated, uh, that can be portable, even implantable in some cases. Um, and then really at that point, you'll have something that is uh, potentially you know, usable by, uh, you know, as point of care even. Uh, and some of them, uh, including paper microfluidics, for example, even by the patients themselves. Uh, so I think there's, there's extreme uh, value to these technologies to not only help us understand the disease, but also change potentially change the way we, uh, uh, we test for, for a disease and, and how we, uh, uh, you know, use it as clinical markers. Thank you for that. Next one is, how could these tests be implemented as diagnostic or treatment platforms for cancer patients? Right, so, so building on the, on, the, on the question before, so I think that microfluidics technologies, they are, um, they are expensive to, to start. There are, um, you know, it takes a little bit to uh, to get the expertise, to get the resources, get the space um, to, to, to really invest in this. But then the running cost of these technologies is actually uh, quite cheap uh, because we're talking of working with nanoliters ra rather than microliters. Uh, you really bring the cost down and sometimes two or three orders of magnitude, which really allows you to, uh, to run these in comparable or cheaper costs than uh, current tests, and they're much faster. So, you know, while you have to wait for uh, days for a colony to grow with microfluidics technologies, you can detect replication of cells in minutes. So we're talking at really a uh, real time type of testing and uh, being feasible and, and going from sample collection to sequencing results can feasibly be done in hours in a, in a, in a microfluidics platform, which, you know, you can uh, really do a very precise treatment, personalized treatment of patients based on, on these technologies. I think it's uh, it could transform medicine, and I'm looking forward to, to see uh, how we can help patients with these. 
Thank you for that. I would like to once again thank Dr. Walther Antonio for her presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 11th, 2019. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.